yeah, she has made up this major. Like, she will be the first person to graduate from Harding with this major. <laughs> she loves to cook delicious foods and be outside and speak Spanish. And she also lives a life that is very driven, very passionate. She loves freely. I'm very excited that you get to hear from her today. So without further ado, Sydney Brandon. <laughs> very thankful to see you all here today. Some of you know me and some of you don't, but I just am very thankful to see you all here. Um, last semester, I was actually in Chile whenever I received the notification that I would be speaking at lectureship. And Chile was just the time of my life. I had so, so much fun. Um, it was full of adventure, and that's kind of where I want to start today, is just a story of adventure in Chile. So, one of my favorites is at the very beginning, whenever we first got there, it was in southern Chile. So if you know your geography of Latin America, that's where the Patagonia Mountains are. And we were staying in this tiny town called Puerto Natales. And two hours from that is Torres del Paine, which is where all the Patagonia Mountains are, like the classic picturesque ones. But one day we had a free day. So we didn't really have transportation. Don't, like we speak Spanish, but not fluently to where just very easy and um, we have little Wi-Fi like no idea really what there is to do or where to go but I found on some like random website there's this mountain nearby called Cerro Dorotea and since you're in Patagonia you have to hike so I was like this is what we must do on this free day we must do this so one morning we wake up and I asked the hotel receptionist in just the broken Spanish that I have like where is Cerro Dorotea and so she was like just that just go left and go six miles and I was like cool so also just ironic because I am the most directionally challenged person like in known among my friends and my family maybe not to you but to the people that know me very very hard for me to get places so somehow I was the leader of this group and I don't know how but we wake up that morning we go and people are like all right Sydney where are we going and I was like just say we're gonna go left here and then we're just gonna go six miles so I started my watch and at six miles I was like we should see something like surely like in America we have signs where it's like hike in you know this is it right here but it's just not the case in southern Chile so at six miles we get somewhere and it was just some house with some gate and just some horses and that was it and I was like this has to be it we're around six miles so we stand at this gate and we just wait and this little small Chilean man comes up and then we're like, right, now we have to talk to him. So we also broke in Spanish talking to him, discovered his name's Juan, he is a cowboy, and this is his land. And Cerro Dorotea, the mountain behind him, was like his. I still don't understand that, but <laughs> we had to pay him money to go and hike this mountain. Just it was super interesting and weird. But it was such an incredible time. Just a lot of unknown and just a lot of guessing and just going with it led to this beautiful view of this and so the lights you know whatever and then like cameras it just never it never captures the beauty of it all but that's the little town that we were staying in and then behind that are just all the beautiful mountains and then the, the ocean so it was just an incredible time and experience so Chile was full 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 of adventure but also full of conversations that were very meaningful and impactful in my life so one of those happened on the bus to Argentina. I and some friends had been quarantined to the back of the bus because we had lice. So we were just sitting back there having lots of good combos. And one of my friends, Mitch, he actually didn't have lice, but he's a great pal, so he sat by me. And he uh, was just talking to me about life and our futures and what we wanted. And I was telling him why I wanted to be a doctor. And then he was telling me why he wanted to be a lawyer. So he was saying that whenever people get in trouble with the law, it's something that they don't know. It's very complicated and it's really hard to navigate. And so a lawyer is just someone who can serve in this way to bring order out of chaos. And so if you read the first slide, that just got my wheels turning. Um, I realized that's something that we all desire in our profession in whatever we do. Why do I want to be a doctor? Well, in a sense, I want to bring order the chaos to heal the broken um, why do you want to do what you want to do maybe that has um, a connection to that 
The Ten Commandments, the first account is in Exodus 20. It all starts with God delivering the Israelites out of slavery uh, from the Egyptians, bringing them through this wilderness and bringing them to Sinai. And that's where he delivers the Ten Commandments to them. Um, he says to Moses, he says, Say to the house of Jacob and tell the people of Israel, you, you yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagle's wings and brought you to myself. Now, therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all peoples, for, for all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the people of Israel. So God brings these people out of years and years and years of slavery to this wilderness, but is still giving them hope uh, that they will be his treasured possession. Just listen to him, follow him. So Moses goes and tells the people, and they say, all that the Lord has said we will do. He has provided manna for us. He's provided water for us. And um, he's bringing us to this land. And we're not sure what's going to happen, but we're trusting in him. So all that the Lord has said we will do. It's a very submissive and humble response that they give to him. So then God tells Moses, okay, in a few days I'm going to come down on Mount Sinai uh, in, in front of the people so that they will know my word and they will fear me and obey me. So in order to prepare for God coming, they had to consecrate themselves. They had to clean themselves and do these certain practices or sacrifices so that they could be holy enough to stand in the presence of God. And so this is the part of scripture that I love. Like I would just love to be in the minds and the eyes of the Israelites at this time. One, you're preparing for God's arrival. Like what, what does that feel like and um, how would I want to be in that time and then you're about to see see God in a way that who knows what that looks like you just have a few days and I just wonder what that anticipation was like for them um, but in order to really visualize this now I looked up a picture of Mount Sinai and did a tiny bit of research it's actually uh, this is Jebel Musa. This is where they believe that the Ten Commandments were given. Mount Catherine is the mountain beside it. It's slightly taller. And these are all in the holy mountain peaks. Um, you can actually trek up this mountain if you're interested. That's where I got this picture. Um, so, yeah, so just imagine this as I read this next part. Try to um, imagine it and feel it and be there. On the morning of the third day, there were thunders and lightnings and a thick cloud on the mountain and a very loud trumpet blast, so that all the people in the camp trembled. Then Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet God, and they took their stand at the foot of the mountain. Now Mount Sinai was wrapped in smoke because the Lord had descended on it in fire. The smoke of it went up like the smoke of a kiln, and the whole mountain trembled greatly. And as the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder, Moses spoke, and God answered him in thunder. So the Lord came down on Mount Sinai to the top of the mountain, and the Lord called Moses to the top of the mountain, and Moses went up. As God is giving these Ten Commandments to Moses, the Israelites just hear thunder as God's voice. Just insane to be there and to just be thinking, like, I don't know what's going on, but I'm terrified. Like, they were terrified. They couldn't touch this mountain or they would be killed. This presence of God was so so much holier than they could ever imagine or ever be. Um, and so they were so scared that they say to Moses in Exodus 20, 18 through 21, Now when all the people saw the thunder and the flashes of lightning and the sound of the trumpet and the mountain smoke, the people were afraid and trembled, and they stood far off and said to Moses, uh, You speak for us, uh, we'll listen to you, but do not let God speak to us or we're going to die. They were like, just you do it, we'll stay back here, we'll do whatever he says, just please, we don't, we can't handle that anymore. The fear of God has been placed in them, they have seen him and they have heard him, because of this they are afraid. So surely, surely they won't disobey him, right? Like, I don't know if I would, like if I had encountered that insane presence, surely not. But this is the part that just is like, to me. Um, <laughs> just in chapter 24, Moses brings Aaron, Nadab, Abihu, and 70 elders up to this mountain with him to worship God and to be with God, people who are leading the Israelites. So Moses has experienced God in this very personal, powerful way. 
the elders have experienced God in this personal, powerful way, but not quite like Moses. And then the Israelites have, as well as they stand at the base of the mountain and experience this all. But yet, in chapter 32, when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down from the mountain, when he's at the top getting the Ten Commandments, um, the people gathered themselves together to Aaron and said to him, Up, make us gods who shall go before us. As for this Moses, the man who brought us out of the land of Egypt, we don't know what has become of him. How, how does that happen? How could they have forgotten this presence that they had encountered, this power that they had encountered? One that said, you shall make no other gods before me. You shall have no idols. You shall respect my name. You shall remember the Sabbath. You shall honor your father and mother. Do not kill. Do not steal. Do not commit adultery. Do not covet. Do not bear false witness. He says all these things to them. And the first one they end up breaking just just a few chapters later. So we could look at that and we could say, well, the Ten Commandments, they're, they're so oppressive. They're just this law that God lays down. And these people had just been delivered out of slavery, of 400 years of slavery. And now, look, they're here and they just want to be free. Like, let them be free, God. But no, you're going to give them ten laws. Obey this. And, or you're going to die. Like, this is very scary. Um, this book I was reading to prepare for this by Patrick Miller, it's called The Interpretations of the Ten Commandments. I had no idea about it, but Max Sandlin gave it to me, so it's a great help. Uh, he says in his book, rather than being rigid, fixed, archaic, and obvious, the commandments open up a moral and theological arc for a movement that began long ago and is still going on. They are dynamic, open in meaning and effect, and uncovering many dimensions, subtle and obvious, for the moral life of the community that lives in covenant with the Lord of Israel, who is known to us in Jesus Christ. They are the foundation of basic principles, and out of them, through the New Testament and the rest of the Old Testament, we are able to understand them. Um, you look at the story of Joseph, and the scene where Bathsheba, wait, no, that's David, that's my next point. This is the scene where um, Potiphar's wife is tempting him, and he could um, commit adultery with her. But he doesn't because it's against God, and that's just not what he has to do. He still goes to prison. He still It's not great for him anyways, but he still obeys God and his law. And that's an example of one of the, the Ten Commandments in uh, the canon. But then also there's David, who coveted Bathsheba. There she is. And that example is him breaking those commandments and what happened there. And so all of scripture just shows that beautiful arc of the covenants and how, and how they are um, seen. So how could they have disobeyed? How could they have gone against God um, just later on? Despite the beauty of the Ten Commandments, despite um, God's love and how he has brought them out of this wilderness and out of this enslavement, how could they have done that? Does anyone here know what entropy is? Yeah, a few. Um, it's the second law of thermodynamics. And so it states that it's the natural tendency, the natural tendency, the easy thing is going to happen, for any isolated system to degenerate into a more disordered state. So I know that's like, blah, 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 blah words, words, words. So I have some examples. Okay, so. How many of you, your room looks like this? I mean, this is not a picture of my room, that would be cool. Um, but this is what a lot of times we strive for and what we want. We like love our rooms to be clean, we love our spaces to be nice and ordered. And whenever they're there, we're like, yes, this is good, I can rest here. That's how I am at least, I like need a clean space to study. But in order for my room to get that way, I don't just snap my fingers. Like I wish it was that way, I wish I could just be like, all right, done. But I have to put energy into that, and I have to work to clean my room. Otherwise, if I don't, it looks like this. And maybe that's extreme, but honestly, in college, sometimes not. It really can look like this sometimes. It, it just takes a week, honestly. A week of craziness, of me not putting things away, of me just being a little bit reckless, and it's this. How, how does that happen? Well, it's entropy. It's just the natural way of things. And in order for it to be this, I have to put energy into it. 
Um, another example that I have is with my family. We moved recently this summer. And as we were moving, I was like, never again will I buy one more thing. I don't want to box another thing. I don't, I'm done. like, this is ridiculous. And so I was like, I'm going to be a minimalist. Yeah. So <laughs> I was like, I'm going to get rid of all my things. I'm going to live on just what I need. This is, the, this is the life. Like, this is what everyone should do. So next time I move, I don't have to move a ton of stuff. It's just easy. So then I start getting rid of stuff. And I start going through stuff. And I was like, this is actually terribly hard. This is just not easy. I sometimes don't know the five shirts that I need or the one pair of shoes that I need or just what exactly to have in my space. Like, I don't know. And so then I just gave up. And I, like, <laughs> and I can't be a minimalist now. I admire it. But one day, hopefully, I'll get there. It just requires a lot of energy. And it's, it's not easy to do that. And that's entropy. Um, an example that we experience every day is especially with schoolwork. It's easy to just blow it off, to go and hang out with your friends, to do whatever you want, but it's hard to sit down and to study and to do what you know you should do, what will make you smarter, what will get you better grades, but it's just easier to go the other way. Or with relationships. It's easy, or it would be easy, to just be like, ah, just talk to them later. I need to, I want to do things for myself, or I don't really want to invest in them right now. But it takes energy, and it takes a part of us to talk with this person, to invest in them, to constantly be with them in, through the good and the bad. And that's what brings that relationship that we desire, but it just requires a lot of us. Or with working out. Um, if anyone was just like, yeah, working out super easy, it's my natural tendency to just work out all the time and eat the right things all the time, I feel like you're a superhuman. I don't know how you do that. But it's, it's not, that's not our natural ways. We just want to relax, lay down, eat a cookie, you know? That's just what sounds best and nice. Without any effort, systems will decay. So we must exert effort to create useful types of order that are resilient enough to withstand the unrelenting pull of energy, of entropy, not energy. Um, what's so incredible, though, about life and about this world is that despite all of these entropical forces and all of these ways that lead us to disorder and chaos, we still see life and order and beauty. Um, it has an overwhelming presence. It is organized and it is structured and it is stable. One example of this that I have is with music. Um, whenever we experience wonderful and beautiful music or art, we, we stop and we admire it and we marvel at it and we love it. It's something that has multiple parts that seem crazy on their own, but they come together in this beautiful ordered way that just um, strikes us. And so this is a song that you heard recently. The song isn't insanely like sentimental to me, but just listen to all of these instruments um, they're all different and unique, and they're playing something separate, but hearing them together is just beautiful and ordered. Oh, hopefully, no, not that part. <laughs> Sorry, I, just, I was trying to get to the instrument. exceptional at that but just look like the order of that like despite all this chaos in our world and how things just tend to naturally 
go and degenerate. This is something that we that we just is all around us. It, it encompasses us. It is beautifully ordered and incredible. And then within these cells, it's even more incredible. And this next slide, just get ready. So <laughs> this uh, is the metabolic pathways within a cell. And so honestly, when I first look at this, I'm like, are you kidding me? That's like crazy and chaotic and wild. But actually, everything happens at a perfect time, at the right way. It's super tiny. But without this functioning, you wouldn't function. It's small and wonderful and beautiful and ordered. And whenever we see these things, we're like, how does that work? How does that happen despite all the chaos in our world? And I look at this and I just see that. That's just evidence of a God who is investing in, in creation and ordering things. A God who loves us and pours into us and orders this chaotic world that we live in. Uh, his methodical foot fingerprints, I almost said footprints, sort of his methodical <laughs> fingerprints are evident on the macro and micro scale. His energy is fixed into creation in order to reclaim and redeem it to his glory. The Ten Commandments are just one of the many ways that God orders a creation of chaos and sin. So order, it brings about beauty. And we can see that in just these uh, small, small micro things. We can see the love of God for the Israelites in the Ten Commandments. But this order that the Ten Commandments brought for the Israelites, not only were they a beautiful thing for God that shows his heart and his compassion for these people, but it also brought freedom to the Israelites. We could think that the Ten Commandments were oppressive. Like I said earlier, that they were just a way for God to control these people, and if you obey these laws, good will happen. Um, but that's just not how it works, and it's just not who God is at all. The Ten Commandments brought freedom and not oppression. As God begins to give the laws to Moses, he identifies himself as the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, the house of slavery. He first identifies his relationship with them as very personal and as delivering them out of this horrible enslavement to the Egyptians. The commandments pro provide ways for the Israelites to live in both freedom and subjection. Freed to God, and subjected to the law that describes the specifics of how to live in this new freedom. They've just been slaves for 400 years, and now they're in this time of what do we do? Where are we? And God, in his compassion and his just nature to order, to invest in creation, to put his energy into it, he gives them the Ten Commandments, and he brings to them this freedom. So how could they have rebelled? Well, I think that explains it. They, the Israelites, settled for this, this cheaper freedom that they had known for so long. It was just natural for them to go back and to think, yeah, sure, like, this is just what other people do, too. Like, we'll just have these other gods. And it just required so much more of them, so much more of a heart change, and so much more of who they were to say, no, I'm going to obey these commandments. I'm going to trust in God and do as he says. So... That makes me ask, what do we settle for? Do we settle for any freedoms that that just seem like they are free of oppress, oppressiveness or they are, are void of any harm or anything bad? We just want to be free and do whatever we want. We want to have autonomy and have control of our lives. What do we settle for like the Israelites did? So if we ever find these commandments to binding and maybe because we don't know what it's like to be slaves for 400 years and to be liberated from a terrible slavery into this new service. These are some verses that describe that new service that we have been liberated into. Live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but living as servants of God. Going from one enslavement to chaos and sin, which is natural in this world, to a new one, which is in freedom in Christ and obeying him and living in him. But thanks be to God that you who were once slaves of sin have become obedient from the heart to the standard teaching to which you were committed, and having been set free from sin have become slaves to righteousness. Life with God does not mean predictability or questioning every move in a legalistic way. 
but it does mean empowerment to run with freedom in his will, to love and commune and explore uh, his unknown and beautiful creation. This doesn't protect us from the chaotic ways of this world. We still feel them and experience them, just like the Israelites did. We feel the ways of doing things in the easy way or going against God. It's just, it would be a lot easier. But it's not. And um, we live in a way of freedom to Christ, where we constantly invest in him, and we love him, and we pursue him, but he does the same for us in this beautiful way of him putting energy into the system. This allows us to be instruments of hope and reconciliation and re restoration and peace in this chaotic world. So God's law and this beautiful, weird irony creates freedom that spurs spontaneity. It's chaos with the king. It's 12 college students roaming around in southern Chile who just like have no idea where they're going or what they're doing in this complete unknown, but yet are led to this beautiful mountain, this top that takes their breath away and reminds them of God and his power and his creation. God has, he is, and he will continue to order this fallen and chaotic world. The Ten Commandments are evidence of this. And they cannot be seen as legalistic and oppressive, but rather freeing to a group of people who knew only slavery to chaos. So that is my presentation today. And I just want to, again, thank you all for coming. And I hope that as you leave, that you see the, the entropy around you and that you, you're not fooled by it. And you, you do the hard things sometimes and you invest the energy um, because the reward is great then we have been freed to this new service, to serve Christ, to glorify his name, and to love the people around us. So thank you again for coming, and I hope you all have a great night.